Hey guys, Saturday, March 18th, 10 a.m. I hope y'all had a great St. Patrick's Day yesterday. Don't mind the hat, it's like pouring here in South Carolina. Um, anyway, I wanna continue on in our journey, um, our research journey regarding the Christian or the Catholic charismatic movements. Um, so the last video I did, I kind of gave a, um, a history of the origin of it, where this came from. And today I want to talk about like the early stages of development and who were the key um, church figures, if you will, um, in allowing this to take root, this um, ecclesiastical movement. And so um, I have gotten accused um, quite a lot, many times um, over the last week by charismatics of being one-sided. And I assure you that's not my intention. Um, I... I have questions and I research to answer, I use research to answer my own questions. Um, so I felt the need to share my research um, with other people because again, I keep getting accused of being one-sided, um, of being deceived, of going down rabbit holes, um, of really all kinds of things. Um, I'm a danger to people's healing. Um, that's not my intention, y'all. That is not my intention. Um, and so after my last live stream yesterday, somebody actually reached out to me, a friend of mine, and told me that I should go to the Life in the Spirit um, uh, seminar um, because it would be good for my healing. And all I appreciate y'all, really. Like, thank you for having my best interests at heart. But I have firmly decided to stay very far away from the charismatic movement for very specific and good reasons um, that I hope to share with you. But I'm, I'm not, you know, obviously that is my intention, but it's it's really to provide research and, and resources to people. Because here's the thing, um, I get a call, to, I get accused of being one sided, but the whole church has heard the charismatic movement loud and clear. In fact, we can't hear much else. So maybe it would be nice to have the other side, um, the rad trad side or something like that. And I'm not here to take sides. I honestly had questions about things that didn't look right to me within the movement. And I had concerns about people who are heavily involved in the movement not having a good understanding or a solid foundation of what it means to be Catholic um, and very obvious um lifestyle interesting that I'm not going to get into but this was sparked not because I was wanted to bash anybody but because I had serious questions that research answered for me and so when I began to do my research on this particular movement my questions were answered and I was confirmed in what the Holy Spirit was telling me to stay far away and so people are telling me, I'm deceived. Okay, um, well, your Holy Spirit is telling you to go to these things and get baptized in the Spirit. And my Holy Spirit is telling me not to. So I think we need a more neutral and a more, um, um, I don't want to say neutral, but a more objective approach to this because if you feel you're supposed to go one way and I feel I'm supposed to go another way and we're both claiming that it's the Holy Spirit talking to us well then how do we decide who is right and how we decide who is right or or maybe we're both right I don't know um but we have to look at it objectively where did this movement come from why do I have concerns with it um Yada yada. So my intention is not to be one sided. Uh, my intention is not even to um, undermine anybody's good experiences with it. Um, I believe God does take things and make good come out of them because he is a good and merciful God. That's what I believe. So please don't misunderstand me. But there is there are people, believe it or not, that do question this movement and it doesn't look right to them. And they get ostracized a lot of times by the charismatics that we're somehow less enlightened or that we're hearing things wrong or that we're not really, we don't know how to pray and all this stuff. And quite frankly, that's offensive and that's rude. Like somehow I'm less than a Catholic because I don't want to get baptized in the spirit 
Well, let me tell you about getting baptized in the Spirit. I can go to any Pentecostal or non-denominational church in my immediate five-mile radius and get baptized in the Spirit and witness people speaking in tongues. So how does that make me less Catholic if I don't want to do that? It's offensive. So please don't do that and don't bring that on my channel and don't bring that in my emails or on my text messages or anything like that because I'm not here to judge anybody's faith walk or anything. I have legitimate questions about a strange and new movements within the church that I need to address for myself and that's what these videos are about. If somebody else gets something out of them, great. But first and foremost, this is about me questioning what I see going on around me in my church that I have a right to be in, that I am a baptized Catholic by infancy. So that's how I feel about that. Um, all right, so the first thing I'm gonna go over is again, this peer reviewed article. This is a neutral article. This is not a charismatic bashing article. This is not a charismatic promoting article. This is legitimately, if I can find it, because I have a hundred tabs pulled open. Um, this is a peer-reviewed article from EUPpublishing.com, and it literally is just factual documenting what happened, um, documenting the movement from its inception, okay? And so I want to talk about that a little bit. So as we learned yesterday, um, we um, so basically what had happened was there was two um, Catholics at... I know I'm saying, I think it's Duquesne University, I believe I was pronouncing that wrong, um, who were trying to, they had very good intentions. They were trying to evangelize the campus. They were trying to make people on fire for the faith, okay? They were well-meaning. Um, unfortunately, what happened was they were um, exposed to some Protestant influences within the area, which led to them going to a Protestant Episcopalian prayer service, having somebody lay hands on them who was not a priest, unfortunately, which led to them getting baptized in the spirit. Um, and they then brought this perspective um, to a retreat in which other people were um, back on the Catholic campus in which other people were baptized in the spirit um, and transformed in Christ which then led to them bringing that to other universities. So really what this is when we look at history, um, this, is the ch this is how revivals work. We just saw it with the Asbury revival, right? Um, this is very common in the Protestant world. This is Catholics think, think that this was like a new thing. This was not a new thing. Um, these are very common in the Protestant world. They were then and they still are now. I think a lot of people don't, maybe don't have a lot of experience. A lot of Catholics don't have an experience with Protestantism. Um, but I can tell you from just living in the Bible Belt down here, I have friends who will go to revivals and they will um, live stream them on their Facebook channel and they look exactly like a, chariz a Catholic charismatic revival. There's... <laughs> There's really no difference except maybe the Catholic one at some point will have mass and adoration, okay? Um, I've gotten invited to them. I've turned those invites down. But they're constantly going on through the different non-denominational churches, the Baptist churches, the Pentecostal churches. All the Protestant churches have them here. This is not specific to Catholicism, okay? I think it was new um, to the Catholics of this um, time period because they had been kind of sheltered in a a Catholic environment their whole life. But as far as the big wide world is concerned, this is not new. Um, so for them, for the Catholic church, this was nominal. Um, but for the Protestant world, it was not. So, okay. So that's kind of, so let's see what happened after that. So it, de it then developed to Notre Dame. Okay. Um, so in the spring, and actually we're going to go back to 1973. In the spring of 1973, Father Michael Dubois, a priest from Belgium, was introduced to the Word of God charismatic community in Ann Arbor, Michigan. As someone who had come from Europe to experience the Catholic charismatic renewal in person, he stayed with community members in their homes, attended prayer meetings, met with a variety of small groups, and participated in seminars. 
Only at the end of his approximately five-day visit did he reveal to everyone his true identity. Cardinal Leon Joseph Sunens, Archbishop of Mal- uh, Malins, Brussels, and primate of Belgium, and one of the four moderators of Vatican II. Few in the community knew who he was, and his plan for um, a not anonymity worked well enough that he was able to have a personal encounter with this new movement in the U.S., known at that time as Catholic Pentecostalism. Okay, and so that's really what it is. So it was, um, Pentecostalism is a denomination in the Protestant world, okay? And we're going to get into that later, not right now. Now we're just focusing on the development. So later it was widely known as the Catholic Charismatic Renewal, hereafter referred to as the CCR. The immediate result of the Cardinal's visit could be seen in the popular charismatic magazine, New uh, New Covenants. The June 1973 issue showed a photograph of Sunens alongside um, Ralph Martin and Steve Clark, two recognized leaders of the movement who were based in Ann Arbor, Michigan, but already well-known worldwide, and prominently featured an interview which Sunens expressed his approval for Catholic charismatics and his willingness to assist them. And so from what I understand, the American clergy were not open to this. They saw major problems. Um, They were not open to this at all. And so I kind of had a a red flag moment here, personally in my own research, that it took an undercover bishop, an undercover cardinal from Belgium um, to come over and take up this cause. That's really interesting. Um, You would think it, it, it... maybe should have um, naturally progressed through the authority of the bishops and the diocese and things like that. Um, But anyway, so that's really what happened there. Um, Now there were, I'll get into in a minute. Hold on, let's stick to this. The long-term results were obvious as time went on. At his suggestion, so talking about the cardinal, The 1973 Annual Conference for Leaders in the Charismatic Renewal, which previously had been held in Ann Arbor, was moved to Grotta Grotta Ferrata near Rome. And the 1975 International Conference for Catholic Charismatics, which had been held annually at the University of Notre Dame in Indiana since it began in 1967, was moved to Rome, where Charismatics had their first public encounter with a pope, Paul VI. At the main altar of St. Peter's Basilica, Sunens gave his famous official speech calling the renewal Un un Chance Por L'Iglise. Eventually, he was appointed by Pope Paul um, VI as a special advisor to oversee the reception of the CCR into the Catholic Church. So they were very aware that this was something that came from outside the church and there had to be a special commission set up to import it into the church, okay? So what does that tell you? It tells you it was new to the Catholic church. Um, Okay, so let's see. Becoming, all right, so special advisor to oversee the reception of the CCR into the Catholic church, becoming in effect a patron of the movements. Between 1974 and 1986, Sunans collaborated with a commission made up of theologians and leaders of the CCR, which produced six documents known as the Malines documents, as guidelines for the Catholic charismatic movement. That period, the second half of the 1970s and the first half of the 1980s, was the golden era of the charismatic movement, which was expanding not only throughout North America, but also in Latin America, Europe, and the rest of the world, gradually acquiring particular indigenous traits and becoming a movement that today has more than 160 million followers. The focus of this article is to explore the emergence and in institutionalization of the CCR in North America, particularly in the U.S. Midwest and its growing interactions with the wider church. In fact, the academic 
historiography of CCR has not properly taken into account the development of the early organizational structures of the movement and the reaction of the ecclesiastical authorities toward it. Although popular insider historical works such as books by Kevin um, and Dorothy Ragahan and Father Connor offer insights, they can be they um, offered insights. These can be considered as primary sources rather than his historiographical material. Also, U.S. historians have paid little attention to the origin of the Catholic charismatic movements, and their research has focused chiefly on its impact on American Catholic laity. And I believe that is what holds the key to all our concerns for those of us who are looking at something saying, something's not right here. Like this, um, we've heard about the fruits. I promise you we have. We've heard about the signs and wonders. In fact, that's all we're told to look at. Um, but I want to know, like, where did this thing come from? I'm an investigator. I have an investigative nature. I want to know everything about something if I'm going to be a part of it. Do you know what I mean? Okay. So certainly the development of lay spirituality and lay interaction with social structures in the United States in the 50s and 60s forms an essential background to the rise of a charismatic spirituality among Catholics. Um, but a much wider range of factors was involved, precisely because the significant role of North American lay charismatic leadership in conjunction with the work of Cardinal Sunins shaped the history of the charismatic renewal within the Catholic Church, resulting in its early legitimization and its transformational diffusion. It is worthwhile investigating this story, and I totally agree. Okay. So, um, I don't know how much I want to get into there. Let's, let's talk about this. Um, I'm trying to think where I'm going to... So it has been well documented, again, that the CCR began in February 1967 at Pittsburgh's du, uh, Duquesne, I guess, University, um, when a history professor and graduate student, I read this yesterday, but they were baptized in the Holy Spirit by Episcopalians. That's how it started. This is well documented. This is a peer-reviewed article on a neutral EPUB publishing website. This isn't a trad trad writing this, okay? Um, and we will even see um, something else in a minute that I'll get into. So through personal contacts, the experience of the baptism in the Holy Spirit soon spread to the University of Notre Dame, then to Michigan State, which is where um, Dr. Ralph Martin was. Beginning in 1967, at an ever-increasing number of locations, regular prayer meetings, usually weekly and sometimes covenant communities developed, often with many college students participating from the outset. In the spring of 1967, charismatic Catholics in South Bend in the University of Notre Dame decided to hold a meeting, which was named the Michigan State Weekend and known in retrospect as the first international conference of the CCR. A group of Catholic Charismatics from Michigan State came um, to the Notre Dame campus to pray, discuss, share stories, and celebrate with local Indiana participants. The yearly successors of the conference grew to become multi-layered events by which Catholic Charismatics, Charismatics fostered and maintained their existence in a self-conscious way. These conferences were held at Notre Dame every year until the 1980s and were internationally respected events during which charismatic spirituality could be spread to committed participants and to newcomers. They were also an opportunity for theologians and a wide variety of charismatic leaders from within the movement to meet together, discussing the progress of the movement and their deepening understanding of its patterns and impact and devising ways to legitimize their evolving experience and structures within the tradition and structure of the Catholic Church. So in 1969, the leaders who gathered at the Third International Conference agreed to establish a formal office, the communication center that would, among other things, publicize the CCR and establish itself as a source of trustworthy information about baptism in the spirit, group prayer meetings, and the biblical and theological foundations of a charismatic spirituality. At the same meetings, 
Leaders also established the Catholic Charismatic Renewal Service Committee, later shortened to National Service Committee, with the aim of providing services such as organizing conferences for the public uh, and for leadership training. Okay, um... They discuss how a, a continual problem for the early leaders um, was the fact that trying to make this Catholic, trying to fit this into theology. And so they had somebody, um, let's see, they had a couple, um, so Father Edward O'Connor so in spite of this hesitation and criticism in the 1970s, the charismatic communities in Notre Dame consolidated their leadership. Hold on. Yeah, so with the rapid development of the renewal, a question of constant concern among the leadership was how to guarantee the legitimacy of the CCR as a Catholic movement. Now, why would they need to do that? if it wasn't imported from Protestantism. So that's where I don't understand how you can call this an, an organic Catholic movement when it's not. They're, they spent years trying to make it into that because it wasn't that. Um, and so there is, so anyway, Father O'Connor, let's see, with the rapid development of the renewal, a question of constant concern among the le leadership was how to guarantee the legitimacy of the CCR as a Catholic movement. First of all, it is impossible to underestimate the role of several theologians, mainly priests who had who at the very beginning studied the history of the charismatic tradition within the Catholic Church, first assessing its orthodoxy, but also warning of possible dangerous tendencies such as biblical fundamentalism, elitism, and emotionalism. Father O'Connor was a key figure in this regard. He was a Holy Cross priest, professor in the theology department at the University of Notre Dame, and author of the Pentecostal Movement in the Catholic Church, published in 71, which I downloaded because I'm not one-sided. Which was together, okay, so he ended up resigning, Father O'Connor. Um, so he wrote this book, he goes on, and he ends up resigning. So eventually, Father O'Connor's resignation in the late 1973 caused a minor, uh, minor crisis among Catholic charismatics, partly because the reasons he expressed for his resignation concerned the CCR leaders, authority, and to a certain extent, the soundness of the movement as a, whole, as a whole, as a Catholic entity. That's frightening. Despite the fact that O'Connor's motivations were complex and also affected by personal interrelationships with the other leaders of the movement, there is no doubt that one of the driving factors was his concern about the position that the service committee was taking, a position of unchallenged leadership that thrust upon it the burden, the responsibility, and the temptation of providing spiritual guidance for many thousands of people. And that is my biggest concern as well. There is no way that all of these charismatics who are prophesying and um, doing all this weird stuff that they're receiving, the church can't possibly spiritually advise every individual one. It's impossible. It's impossible. But in the meantime, they're spreading their nonsense. Okay. And so historically, when we see charisms pop up in the church, it's among saints who have access to spiritual directors because they live in convents or in monasteries or in rare cases, lay people who have like Anna Maria Taiji, who had a priest living with her at one point. Um, but to just have this mass, it, it's, it's insanity. It's actual insanity. It's chaos. And my God is not the God of chaos. He's not. Okay, so I want to talk about these two key figures. Um, the first one I want to talk about is Bishop Sunens. Leo Joseph Cardinal Sunens, a Vatican II leader, dies at 91. Now, this is not a rad trad source. I am reading this from the New York Times because this was the first thing I had to see. So for me, it sounded very, very strange 
um, that there was a cardinal going undercover and doing weird things and pushing this on. Like, this is odd. Like, he's in Belgium. Like, why he's going to go to the Midwest, the flyover state? The whole thing just kind of, I had red flags going off in my head. I'm not saying he's wrong. I'm not saying any of that. I'm saying for me personally, I had some questions that I needed to find out. So, of course, I Google his name. Who is this cardinal? I knew nothing about him. I had never heard of him. And we come up. The first thing, one of the first things I came across was an article in the New York Times um, when he died, May 7th, 1996. Leo Joseph Cardinal um, Sunins, whose public and behind the scenes leadership at the Second Vatican Council made him a major architect of the 20th century Roman Catholicism, which is interesting. What is 20th century Roman? Isn't what? <laughs> died yesterday in Brussels. He was 91. Active to his last day, the retired Archbishop of Brussels and Primate of Belgium was planning to attend a symposium in his honor at John Carroll University in Cleveland at the end of this month. Apart from Pope John XXIII and Pope Paul VI, Cardinal Sunins would rank among the two or three most important leaders of the council. Said the Reverend Joseph A. Kamenchak, a professor of theology at Catholic University in Washington. The landmark meetings of the world's Catholic bishops held in four sessions from 19, um, October 1962 to December 1965 authorized changes in the liturgy, including the use of local languages instead of Latin, expanded the role of lay people, endorsed religious liberty, and promoted dialogue with other religious groups, and revised the hostile stance that the church had taken toward modernity. None of this might have been accomplished without the skillful intervention of Cardinal Sunens. Sunens, they actually give the pronunciation, thank you, in the spring of 1962. Vatican II's preparatory commissions had produced dozens of proposed texts, many of them rigid and restrictive in tone, that promised either to bog down the bishops in details or put pressure on them to rubber stamp the documents. Cardinal Sunin sent Pope John XXIII a critique of these texts and earned his approval to prepare an alternative agenda for the council, focusing on a handful of key questions in dividing the work into an internal church reform on the one hand, and the church's relations with the rest of the world on the other. The Belgian Cardinal's um, presentation of this alternative approach during the council's first session was a turning point in the bishop's deliberations. Pope John then appointed him to a new coordinating, uh, coordinating committee that reviewed all the preparatory material and before the next session in 63 and essentially set the agenda for the entire council. Pope Paul VI, who succeeded... Pope John, in June of 1963, made Cardinal Sunins one of the four moderators of the council who presided over it. Among the causes the Cardinal advocated were, listen to the causes he was pushing for, modernization of the garb and lifestyle of Catholic nuns. So get rid of the habit, is what he moderated for. That doesn't seem to be working out too well. That's all I have to say about that. Expansion of the laity's responsibilities. Eucharistic ministers, anyone? Um, dangerous practice. Ordination of married men to serve as deacons. Mandatory retirement for bishops. And that's key. Because before him, there was no mandatory retirement. And so that is how the liberals were able to be out with the old and in with the new. That was purely to advance the liberal agenda within the church. And renewed ties with other branches of Christianity and with Judaism. He called for the church to, re oh, this is key. And we are going to come back to this later. And we are going to talk about Padre Pio. He called for the church to re-examine its condemnation of contraception. And when Pope Paul took the question out of the hands of the council, he warned that the church must not have another Galileo case. But the debate that he helped start um, start ultimately ended with a reassertion of the existing condemnation by Pope Paul VI in 1968, and we are going to get back. Excuse me, we're going to get back to that later that year. In a book, can you imagine this man talking about changing the audacity, the pride, changing church teaching on contraception? Are you kidding? 
wow, I was, I was astonished. And apparently Pope Paul VI was also astonished as well. Later that year, in a book titled Co-Responsibility in the Church, the Cardinal expressed concern that the Vatican was retreating from the Council's movement towards shared responsibility and greater lay participation. Mm. In the spring of 1969, on the eve of a meeting of Europe's bishops, he gave interviews in the European press criticizing centralized governance of the church by the Vatican authorities, so undermining the, undermining the monarch. This is what they do. I keep trying to tell y'all. In proposing reforms on issues ranging from the Vatican diplomatic corps to the way popes are elected. Holy smokes. In 1970, he renewed his criticism, insisting that the hierarchy should be free to be opening uh, the priesthood now, not just deacons, the priesthood to married men. This time, Pope Paul, without mentioning this cardinal, expressed grieved astonishment <laughs> at those who criticize papal policies. Despite his identification with liberalizing tendencies in the church, the cardinal was also a defender of traditional veneration of the Virgin Mary and above all the wave of charismatic or Pentecostal Catholicism that surged in the late 1960s and 1970s as a sympathetic liaison between its and the Pope. He helped contain any tendencies within it to splinter from the church. Right, of course, because he wanted them within the church to undermine the church. <laughs> he didn't want them to leave. He wanted them in there. <laughs> oh, boy. All right, so that's the New York Times, y'all. It gets worse. It actually gets worse. Um... Which brings me to another not well-known figure called Father Luigi Villa, an Italian priest who was a secret agent, if you will, of the church, um, given that position of secret agent by the um, predecessor of Pope, John, uh, Pope Paul VI, who was Pope Pius, the great Pope Pius XII. Um... And it is said, although I could not substantiate this, that, but I, this is why I'm getting back to Padre Pio in a bit here. It is said that Padre Pio and him um, hatched this plan, if you will, to expose Freemasonry, fight against Freemasonry within the church. Because at that time, or no, sorry, not at that time, at that time it was creeping in. By the time Paul VI got in, it is said that most of the advisors of Paul VI were, in fact, practicing Freemasons. It is, um, some things have come to light that would suggest that this Cardinal Sunins was one of these people. And so I'm going to get into that here in a minute. Father, Father Luigi Villa um, is said that he was appointed by Pope, um, sorry, Pope Pius XII to uncover Freemasonry within the church hierarchy. And it was said that he was very successful and he names a bunch of Freemasons that were advisors to Pope Paul VI. He also gives evidence that Pope Paul VI may have been involved in Freemasonry, although I don't know. I see him more as being friendly to the Freemasons, no doubt. That's not really up for debate. That's historical facts. He gives them blessings. He meets with them, all kinds of stuff. Um, and then there's, there is some sort of, um, notion, I guess, if you will, or some sort of theory brought forth that Padre Pio and Father Villa had, had hatched this plot really to expose Freemasonry within the church. And so again, I'm not going to get into a bunch of that. Um, the key takeaway from this though, um, in, in relation to our current topic is, Cardinal Sunins made this list. And this was not just a list of this one priest. This list was actually published um, by a secular source. Um, it was called Pacelli's List, I believe. Um, um, I don't know if I am pronouncing that right. I did. I will post the link to that as well. But 1 Peter 5 did cover this. And so this was like kind of a secular... A secular um, posting and then kind of verified, you know, Father Villa came out after that and said, 
yeah, um, I already knew about all these. He brought all this evidence um, to the Holy Father and things like this. So anyway, there's a lot of controversy associated with it. One thing I do want to point out, though, that lends um, water, that makes this theory hold weight, is the fact that right before he died, Padre Pio wrote a letter that has since been published to Pope Paul VI. And in it, he um, encourages him and he um, he applauds him for his encyclical Humanae Vitae. And so I want to read that in a minute. Um, but if we if we we remember, Paul the Sixth um, wrote that encyclical in response to Cardinal Sunin's trying to change contraception laws within the church. So Padre Pio was very aware of liberal, Masonic, possibly Masonic, I do believe there's enough at least circumstantial evidence to lend credence to that. Um, and for the fact, if you all look up Charles Murr, he was a uh, father Charles Murr, he's retired now, but he's heavily aware, involved in all this. He was in the middle of all this. There are actually people charged um, in that were jailed for a Freemasonic conspiracy against the Vatican Bank right around this time. So there was, uh, it, it was uncovered that there was a Freemasonic conspiracy and that's in official teachings and things, or in official court documents and things like this. Furthermore, after um, Cardinal Sunin's death, um, the, I think it was where the Belgium police or whatever, um, exhumed him they they broke into his tomb they drilled into his tomb in search of documents related to the pedophile um activities the pedophile scandals in the church under his um leadership they didn't find any um but they did dig into his um they did they had reason to believe i guess that there was documents in his tomb and so they unearthed him and that was like a cause of outrage at the Vatican and things like that. So it's interesting to see what kind of man this Cardinal Sunins was. We know, um, we can honestly say, Freemason conspiracies aside, although I believe I do believe they do hold some weight, that he was absolutely a liberal. And he absolutely wanted to undermine the traditional official church. Um, and so before I close today... Again, I'm going to post a bunch of resources below for you to read, um, especially read about Father Villa. He was a, there was like seven or so attempts on his life. Like they tried to take him out many times. He was poisoned, all kinds of stuff. Um, so I do actually believe that he um, did have a mission to uncover Freemasonry within the church. And I do from Padre Pio's letter to Paul VI, believe that Padre Pio was at the very least aware of some influences within the church that were undermining the papacy because he says it in his letter. So let's read that really quick. Um, a short time before his death, Padre Pio having in mind the audience, which the chapter members of his order would have in the course of their general chapter, wrote a letter to Pope Paul. In the letter, he expressed his firm adherence to the magisterium, its teachings, particularly mentioning the recent encyclical, Humana Vitae. Padre Pio also expressed his obedience, devotedness, and filial sharing in the anxieties of His Holiness. The full text is as follows. Your Holiness, availing myself of Your Holiness, meeting with the Capitular Fathers, I unite myself in spirit with my brothers and in a spirit of faith, love, and obedience to the greatness of Him whom You represent on earth. Offer my respectful homage to your august person, humbly kneeling at your feet. The Capuchin Order has, the Capuchin Order, has always been among the first in their love, fidelity, and reverence for the Holy See. I pray the Lord that its members remain ever thus, continuing their tradition of seriousness and religious um, asceticism, evangelical poverty, faithful observance of the rule and constitutions, renewing themselves in vigorous living and deep interior spirit. Always ready at the last gesture from your holiness to go forward at once to assist the church in her needs. I know that your heart suffers much these days on account of the happenings in the church. For peace in the world, for the great needs of its peoples, but above all, for the lack of obedience of some, even Catholics, to the lofty teachings which you, assisted by the Holy Spirit and in the name of God, had given us, have given us. I offer your holiness my daily prayers and sufferings, the insignificant but sincere offering of the least of your sons, 
asking the Lord to comfort you with his grace to continue along the direct yet often burdensome way in defense of those eternal truths which can never change with the times. In the name of my spiritual sons and of the praying groups, I thank your holiness for the clear and decisive words you have spoken in the recent encyclical, Humana Vitae, and I reaffirm my own faith and my unconditional obedience to your inspired directives. May God grant truth to triumph, and may peace be given to his church, tranquility to the people of the earth, and health and prosperity to your holiness, so that when these disturbing clouds pass over, the reign of God may triumph in all hearts. And this is interesting. This is how he says, may the reign, tri may reign of God triumph in all hearts. He says, through the apostolic works of the supreme shepherd of all Christians. Prostrate at your feet, I beg you to bless me, my brothers in religion, my spiritual sons, the praying groups, all the sick, that we may faithfully fulfill the good works done in the name of Jesus and under your protection, your holiness, most humble servant, Padre Pio Capuchin. So that's fascinating. So just to recap, um, Pope Paul VI feels the need to write an encyclical um, reaffirming the church's uh, teaching on contraception because Cardinal Sudens was trying to undermine that and wanted this changed at the council. Um, and so in response to that, Padre Pio says, I see what you're doing. Congratulations for doing the right thing. I, I commend you. I praise you for doing the right thing. So um, that lends a whole lot more credence to some sort of theory that Padre Pio was aware of some sort of conspiracy to undermine the church at that time under the pontificate of Paul VI. And there's also things he has said in regards to this um, that are well documented, that his concern was for a false counterfeit church. His concern was about um, what would happen to the church in the future. He was never concerned with chastisements. He was never concerned with natural disasters. He was concerned about what the state of the church would be, the subversion of the church. So that's very, very fascinating. Um, and so we see, um, again, this cardinal who is really instrumental. Without him, I don't believe the charismatic movement would have taken foot in Rome. So Pope Paul VI was the first to welcome and to institutionalize and to um, acknowledge and praise and encourage the charismatic movement. He did have some stark warnings for it, but he did, I guess, approve of it as an official ecclesiastical movement. And allowed it to, um, you know, allowed it to develop. And, and the Pope, all Popes since have taken his lead and said that we have warned against the abuses and warned against the dangers of it, but have all said, let's see where this goes. Um, let's not, let's not squash this. Let's see where this goes. Okay. And so in my next um, video, this is going to be a two-parter because it's getting long. I want to talk about... Um, I want to go back to Father O'Connor or O'Connell, the one who wrote the book and the one who resigned. And I want to talk about what I see there. Um, I don't believe he was told up front about how this developed. He was just enlisted to, I have reason to believe from his own writings that he didn't know that the Duquesne University people sought Protestant, um, whatever, Protestant ideals, ideology outside the church and imported it in. I don't believe he, he knew that. His ta he was tasked really with just trying to um, see if there was some theological weight in the tradition of the church to charisms in general. But the issue at hand here is not the charisms. There is, obviously. You can't deny that. There is the evidence of charisms throughout all of church history, okay? But the movements is the problem. You, we have to be able to separate the movements from the charisms and people can't seem to comprehend that. And I, I don't really understand why. <laughs> Nobody's saying charisms aren't real. Nobody's saying that. Not one person has said that, that I've heard of. Not any critique of the charismatic movement has said charisms are fake. Nobody said that. That's not the issue at hand. I know that people are having like a, a mental breakdown over this, but like, I don't know how else to say it. You have to separate the two. Um, so anyway, it's the movement. That's the issue. And it's the, the methods of the movements that are a really big issue because they're Protestant. 
So um, Father O'Connor, who was used, you know, to support the, the theological side of this, really focused on the charisms, which again, yeah, of course, you're going to look back in scripture and you're going to look back in history and see that there's charisms. Okay, but that doesn't mean the way you're approaching it is correct. And that's the issue. That's the issue at hand that nobody has seen, seemingly been able to address. So I hope to be able to do that in this series. Um, again, I don't think I'm better than anyone. I, I got accused of being arrogant um, because apparently my, I'm saying that my discernment is better than popes and, and, and priests and, and people who've had miracles happen to them. No, that's, first of all, the charismatics like to do that. They like to um, point to people who don't believe in baptism of the spirit or something or who don't want to participate and say that it's a pride thing or it's, it has nothing to do with that or even make it seem like I'm like some obscure person over here and like I'm the only one who thinks this way. I'm not. There's many, many more who think like me and if presented with the evidence in the research that I have been presented with or that I have found will understand better where I'm coming from. So, okay. Anyway, um, I hope y'all have a wonderful day. I'm going to wrap it up. And like I said, I'm going to do a part two and uh, maybe a part three on the development of this movement and, and look at it, break it down, dissect it. Um, but for now, we kind of have an understanding at least of the nature of the biggest supporter or the highest level supporter um, in the church of this movement. So Joan of Arc Media out.